Good evening. My name is Sue Racanelli, and I am president of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. The League has been in Vermont since 1920, and voters trust us to provide them with ob objective and factual information on elections. This is because the League is nonpartisan. We do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Today is the first of two webinars that the League is co-hosting with the Office of the Vermont Secretary of State. In her first term as Vermont's 39th Secretary of State, Sarah Copeland Hanses has made civic education and engagement her priority. She has been advocating that Vermont should consider implementing ranked choice voting, which is a new and powerful way of choosing our leaders. Vermont legislature will also be deciding in their next session whether to start ranked choice voting in the 2028 presidential primary. Here's Sarah to tell us about this evening's program, ranked choice voting and overview. Sarah. Thank you so much, Sue. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for helping us put this program together tonight. I'm Sarah Copeland Hansis, and I thank you for uh, coming out to join us. We're hopefully sitting comfortably in your own kitchen uh, to join us as we talk about uh, ranked choice voting and the possibilities that it could hold for Vermont. Um, we have a great presentation coming up from Ryan Kirby of the Rank Choice Voting Resource Center, um, and he's going to give us a, a good broad overview of what Rank Choice Voting is, how it works, um, and this two-part series that we're having this week and next week are really um, our first foray into reaching out and educating and engaging Vermonters about ranked choice voting so that when the legislature takes up a bill uh, next session to move us to ranked choice voting, folks are already familiar with what it does and how it works. Um, so as Sue said, we're moving towards ranked choice voting uh, for the 2028 presidential primary. And one of the fun aspects of our presentation this evening that uh, I hope you already uh, caught a little glimpse of in the uh, sign up material is we're going to do a mock 2028 presidential primary. Uh, we're going to do a ballot on the Republican ticket as well as on the Democratic ticket. And so later on, you'll be able to see the links to those posted in the chat. And, um, and I hope that you will take the opportunity to vote in uh, either or both of those primaries. Um, you'll see the, the names on that list are, are simply a, a collection of Democrats and Republicans who, whose name appear in the news now. That is not to say that we know that they're interested in running uh, to be president in 2028. It's just uh, an opportunity for us to give an impression of uh, how their support would be if we were using ranked choice voting for our next presidential primary. Um, you'll also see that there's a Q&A function on this webinar, and we hope that you'll go ahead and pop questions into the Q&A. Uh, we've got folks who are helping to collate the questions um, and consolidate them. And after Ryan's presentation, we will be able to uh, dive into some Q&A uh, and, and try to get all of your questions answered. So um, without further ado, I'm going to invite Ryan Kirby of the Ranked Choice uh, Voting Resource Center to join us. And um, thank you, Ryan, for being here. Of course, thank you so much for having me and apologies for the delay while I was pulling up the presentation. Um, so yeah, thank you, Madam Secretary, for the introduction and to the League of Women Voters for hosting. Uh, my name is Ryan Kirby. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Um, and so about the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, briefly, we are a uh, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Uh, we're dedicated to supporting the implementation of ranked choice voting. We don't do any, we have the advocacy of ranked choice voting, um, but we work with election officials across the country and basically try to make their lives as easy as possible when they're tasked with uh, implementing ranked choice voting in their jurisdiction. Um, so for this evening's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about what ranked choice voting is, just kind of get the basics of it, um, where ranked choice voting is being used across the country. Um, we'll have the QR codes for the mock election that was already mentioned, um, which will be a fun experiment for the 2028 presidential election. Um, talk about RCV in presidential primary specifically, um, why jurisdictions look to adopt ranked choice voting, 
Um, I'll show you a couple of sample ballots and see how RCV might look like it when you go to show up and vote. Um, voting equipment that's used in Vermont is kind of like a little bit of a preview uh, for this ne the next week's um, webinar. And then we'll kind of go through the election results from our mock election. And then we'll take uh, questions and answers at the end. Um, so one of the things I find the most helpful uh, when understanding RCV is to look at an actual RCV ballot. Most of us have already cast our first ballot. Um, so seeing how an RCV ballot looks helps provide kind of a helpful anchor when we try and discuss how it's going to work. So picture here are um, some actual sample ballots from Maine's presidential primary held earlier this year. It's just about two months ago. And so you notice they have clear instructions at the top and that help any voter before they get to the RCV contest. Um, on the left, we have the primary ballot for the Democratic Party, and on the right is for the GOP. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight was that on the Republican side, you can see that there were still a number of people on the contest, even though they had dropped out. So, for example, DeSantis had suspended his campaign back in January, but voters could have voted for him by mail or in person on Election Day. Um, whether they did it on purpose or it was an accident, you know, they weren't paying attention to the news as closely. Um, they, could, they still could have selected DeSantis, but because they're using right choice voting, they have the ability to have their um, vote count for another candidate in later rounds. So um, looking at what uh, is ranked choice voting and what do we mean when we say ranked choice voting? So in the simplest terms, we mean that it is a way for voters to rank candidates in the order of their own preference. So as you can see on the ballot, um, it's different from plurality in that you're now providing more information uh, when we go to tabulate the results for the same contest. Voters have the ability to indicate a first choice, second choice, and so on to, ex to express their support for their chosen candidate or candidates until a winner is selected. Uh, when we're talking about ranked choice voting, you'll probably hear other terms um, throughout, whether in other conversation or their legislation. Um, some of these are instant runoff voting or single winner RCV. This ranked choice voting method um, is typically used for electing just one person. So you have a governor, president, mayor, um, or single person legislative seat. Um, then you also hear terms such as the single transferable vote or multi-winner RCV or proportional representation. All of these terms are used to refer to ranked choice voting for a contest where more than one person will be elected. So some of these examples are a city council seat or, or city council where you're voting the, at, at large, or you have multi-member districts. So you have a district, but it's got you know three, four, or five members in it. Um, another term you'll probably hear me use today is called plurality voting. Um, that's what most of us are familiar with. That's where you get one vote um, and whoever has the most votes at the end of the contest wins. Um, doesn't necessarily require a majority, um, but if you hear me using plurality throughout the election, that's what we're talking about or throughout the presentation. Um, so how does RCV actually work? So voters rank their preferred candidates on the ballot. Those ballots are then scanned and centralized to be tabulated. So we're gonna count all of them up. All of the first choice votes are counted, just like a plurality election, and we look for a winner. If no candidate has a majority, then we're gonna begin moving to rounds of counting. But if there is a majority winner on the very first round, we, we already know who won, just like the plurality election. So in our example on the screen, uh, we have candidates A, B, and C, and none of them have a majority. The candidate in last place is eliminated. So in this case, candidate C is eliminated. And the voters who pick that candidate have their ballot transferred to their next choice. Once the ballots have been transferred, we check again for a winner. If a candidate gets a majority, then they are elected. If there are still no candidates with a majority, then we repeat the process of eliminating the last place candidate, transferring the ballots from their voters to the next choice and checking for a winner. So in the example here, um, thanks to the help of second choice rankings from uh, candidate C, candidate A has a majority and is elected. So where is ranked choice voting being used? Ranked choice voting is currently being used in two states, three counties, and 45 cities. Six states are currently using ranked choice voting for their overseas and military voters for runoff elections. Um, they're using that because they're using runoff elections when they don't get a majority winner, um, but their overseas voters, in order to meet certain uh, deadlines in order for them to get a ballot, they send them a ranked choice is voting ballot so they can still participate in the runoff if there is one. Um, some prominent examples of ranked choice voting across the country include uh, Burlington, Vermont. Um, they adopted it in 2021 for their city council elections. And then 2023, they expanded it to cover all local elections. Um, and their first use was in December, 2022 for a special election. Um, well, first recent use at least. 
Um, and for Maine, they first used it in 2018 for state and federal primary elections and general elections for Congress. Uh, another big one was Alaska. They adopted it in 2020, and their first use was, was in 2022 for state and federal general elections. Alaska also had a special election to speed, sped up the time of their implementation, but they um, did a great job with their implementation. New York City is another big one. They adopted it in 2019 for their city primaries and special elections with their first use in 2021. Cambridge, Massachusetts, which adopted proportional representation um, for their city council and school board members um, in, back in 1940. Um, so they've been using uh, proportional representation since way before there were machines to do the tabulation for them. Um, and then lastly, another one I wanna highlight is Portland, Oregon, which adopted ranked choice voting in 2022 and they'll be using single winner RCV and proportional representation later this year. And they will be the largest jurisdiction in the country to use proportional representation. Um, so uh, here's the section where we're gonna do our mock election. Um, so in the chat, there should be the link to both the Democratic and the Republican um, primary uh, mock election using ranked choice voting. Um, we put together this list um, and so you can use your phone to scan the QR code or you can click on the links in the chat. Um, but while you're doing that, I'll just talk a little bit. Um, we use our partner rankedvote.co. They're a great tool for voter education and to hold mock elections or if you wanna make organizational decisions. Um, so while you're getting that out, um, we'll go ahead and start talking about how the presidential primaries work. Um, so one of the legislative issues that Vermont has been considering has been using ranked choice voting in the presidential primary. So just talk a little bit about how the primaries work and then we'll dig into how ranked choice voting can be incorporated into that. So as you may know about the primary process, candidates are traveling the country. They're trying to accumulate as many delegates as possible to get their party's nomination. Republicans award delegates using a winner take all system. The candidate who gets a plurality of votes gets all the delegates for that state. So they can win with 35 or 40 percent of the vote um, and they get all the delegates. There is no majority requirement. Democrats award their delegates proportionally, but only to candidates that meet a minimum level of support. So currently that minimum level of support has been set at 15 percent. So if you're a candidate that gets 16 percent, great, you get your share of delegates. But if you're below that, you don't get anything. Um, and that uh, threshold, that number is determined by the Democratic Party. So they could change it. They could raise it or lower it. Um, and I'll point out that in 2020, five states used ranked choice voting for their presidential primary. And this year, um, both Maine and the U.S. Virgin Islands used um, ranked choice voting. Um, so on the Republican side, um, if ranked choice voting is adopted in Vermont, the GOP would still be able to use pretty much the exact same rules they're already using. They would likely opt to use single winner RCV, um, where they would be able to determine a majority winner, um, which would be a step up from their current plurality winner or system. And in the Democratic presidential primary, Democrats are able to also keep the same rules for the most part that they're already using to award the delegates. The party can still award delegates proportionally and they can determine what the vote, the percentage threshold that they want um, for candidates to get delegates. Um, so if RCV is adopted, Democrats would likely use the bottoms up RCV, which is the method which has been used in previous Democratic RCV primaries. Um, and bottoms up RCV, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide, um, is where you eliminate candidates below the 15% threshold and you transfer their supporters' ballots to their next choice until all remaining candidates are above 15%. And then you award the delegates based on the level of support. Uh, what is bottoms up RCV that's been used in the Democratic primaries? Uh, voters rank their preferences and we tabulate the first choices just like in single winner RCV. Check to see if all candidates are above 15% or if we need to go to further rounds of counting. Uh, one thing to note here is that the party can increase or decrease this threshold, just like they could in the current system. There's two methods that can be used in bottoms up RCV to eliminate candidates below that threshold. Best practice is to eliminate one candidate at a time, eliminating the one with the fewest votes and transferring the voters' ballots to their next choice. The process continues until only the candidates remaining are all above that 15% threshold. So this is considered the best practice because it allows a candidate at 13 or 14 or any kind of close percentage um, to get support from other candidates that were at the very bottom and allow them to cross the 15% threshold. The other method is to eliminate all candidates below 15% and transfer their voters ballots to their next choice. Um, so you would do this ranked choice voting process in just two rounds. You have the first round tabulation, you would eliminate everybody and then everybody below 15% 
and then transfer their ballots to all the remaining candidates. Um, as you saw with the main ballots earlier, the ballot itself stays the same, whether you're doing single winner or you're using bottoms up ranked choice voting. Um, and so the image I had here, which I, let me see if I can get it to load. Just try and refresh the page. Uh, but the image here is a results display that shows how bottoms up RCV worked in the Kansas 2020 Democratic primary. There we go. Um, so as you can see, um, the in this election, Tulsi Gabbard, Uncommitted, and Elizabeth Warren were all eliminated in different rounds. And Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders were the only ones with enough support, and they were awarded delegates. Um, and then one thing I want to note is that the front runners, they all gain support in each of the rounds. So there's this method doesn't punish those who are already doing well. Um, so why do jurisdictions adopt ranked choice voting? So looking at some of the benefits that, that they see, um, it can reduce election costs and campaign costs. Uh, by using RCV, some jurisdictions choose to eliminate runoff elections. Um, those are the ones that occur after an election, after a general election, if you don't get a majority. Um, and those tend to have a lower turnout than on election day. And um, with ranked choice voting, they may no longer be needed because you can have that instant runoff. And that's where that term um, comes from. Additionally, uh, campaigns don't have to worry about a runoff election, so that can save them money and time. Um, and in some cases, RCV has been used to eliminate primaries. Um, so they just have one election, the general election in November, um, and that can reduce costs for both the election administrators and campaigns because they only have to work, run one election. It can increase civility in campaigns. Um, in non-ranked choice voting elections, candidates often turn to mudslinging. They're attacking their opponent's character instead of talking about the issues or their positive vision they, they see for voters. Um, with ranked choice voting, candidates do best when they reach out positively to as many voters as possible, including those supporting their opponents. It can promote fair representation. Legislator, legislatures elected by winner-take-all may lead to distortions in part, partisan representation, the entrenchment of incumbents in safe seats, regional polarization, and low representation of women and racial and ethnic minorities. Um, RCV can also end the cycle of gerrymandering and create competitive elections, um, which every vote counts. If you um, take more of the multi-winner, the proportional representation approach, um, and it's been shown to increase representation of women of color, women and people of color. Um, and then finally, avoiding vote splitting and weak plurality results. It mitigates the spoiler effect, which refers to elections in which two or more candidates with similar political ideologies split a portion of the electoral vote, leading another candidate to win in a plurality of the vote. The spoiler effect has long been a point of contention in close political contests. Um, and in races with numerous candidates, the winner frequently receives less than 50% of the vote. That means that a majority of voters favored somebody else. Um, ranked choice voting allows those voters to express their true preferences. They don't have to worry about uh, choosing between the lesser of two evils or anything like that. Um, and they don't have to vote strategically. They can just vote for their conscience for who they support. Um, so some of the concerns that we hear is that it's a change for voters when they head to the polls. This is going to be a big change and voters are going to be confused. Um, but, you know, voters are they understand the system. They're smart. Um, and we there are election and night um, exit polls that routinely show that. So, for example, 85 percent of voters in Alaska, they found RCV to be simple. Um, and this is a trend that we see in a lot of other jurisdictions in the 80 to 90 percent range. Um, another one is that voters need to evaluate more candidates at once. Um, so it doesn't require candidates, you know, sorry, it does require voters to look more about the candidates. They have to learn more about their options, but that's kind of a good thing. Um, part of that is voter education. Um, the election officials do have to spend more time educating voters about the process, um, but also incentivizes voters to learn more about all of their options. Um, and then uh, an eventual winner doesn't necessarily have a majority of first round votes. That's something we sometimes hear um, as ballots are exhausted. So if they run out of active candidates or they run out of rankings, they're still in the race. Um, the majority is only determined by active ballots, not all ballots cast. 
Um, but while that can happen, the result is still more representative as a whole because voters were able to express a more complete list of preferences between the candidates. So they're able to participate a lot further than a plurality election where you only get to vote for one candidate. And then the last one is of voting equipment. Um, sometimes the jurisdictions will have to make changes to their voting equipment because they're using what's known as legacy equipment. It's really, it's old equipment that already needs to be updated. Um, so whether or not a jurisdiction is updating right choice voting, they probably should be phasing out their legacy equipment anyways. Um, so that's something that should be considered um, for those jurisdictions. Um, so now we have a couple of sample ballots, a um, little bit different than the ones from um, earlier, but this is one that was used in Burlington earlier this year. Um, and so as you can see, they have another set of instructions at the top, and then you can see the candidates and the different choices that are available to them. Um, this one is from Alaska's 2022 election. So as I noted before, um, Alaska had their first election in 2022, um, but they also have a slightly different system. They have what's known as a top four system where they have an open pick one primary. Um, so all of the candidates are running against each other and all the voters have exactly one vote. And then during, after, during that primary, um, all the votes are counted and the top four of those candidates advance to the general election. And the general election is where voters can rank those candidates. So this ballot here is from their general election where they were able to use ranked choice voting. And then lastly, here's a ballot from East Hampton, Massachusetts from their 2021 election. Um, so one thing I wanna highlight is that you may have noticed a pattern to some of these slides and that why I chose some of these examples. Um, the word dominion right here, um, that refers to the voting equipment vendor um, that is used in those jurisdictions. And so the reason I chose those sample ballots is because uh, Vermont uses Dominion voting system equipment, um, which leads me to my next slide about Dominion voting equipment. Um, so according to our uh, assessment of Vermont's voting equipment, um, last year there were 175 municipalities in the state using Dominion voting equipment, and the remaining 72 were hand counting their elections. Um, and so that Dominion equipment is already RCV capable, meaning it can count and process RCV ballots. And Dominion does offer the built-in tabulation software, which is the tool that does the round-by-round -round counting. Um, their equipment can handle up to 10 rankings. Um, so that's just, you know, if you had 10 candidates, you could be able to rank all of them if your heart desired. Um, and one of the most frequent questions that we tend to get from election administrators is whether or not RCV races can go on the same ballot as non-RCV races? And the answer is yes. Um, and so, as you can see on the list of example RCV jurisdictions with the same equipment, there are other jurisdictions already out there using this kind of um, equipment and they're conducting ranked choice voting elections. Um, and kind of a preview for the, your next week's webinar, um, talking a little bit about some of the administrative changes, the things that when implementing ranked choice voting that tend to come up. Um, so one of those is voter education. It's probably one of the most important things. Election officials, they have to spend time updating their existing voter education campaigns, um, and they have to include information about the new changes. They have to educate voters about how to use their ballot, what election night results will look like, um, and they have to work with candidates as well as to how to, uh, to run for office, what is that gonna be like differently, um, and are there any other changes to the system. Ballot design, as you saw in the previous slides, the ballot will look a little bit different. Um, and that means updating the instructions and making all the contests fit on the ballot while maintaining best practices for usability. Uh, for voting systems, some jurisdictions are using legacy equipment, which is already due for replacement. And But um, that is irregardless of ranked choice voting. Um, when I was referring earlier to the 72 municipalities that were hand counting their elections, um, there are some RCV jurisdictions that are have a mix of like that as well. Um, so Maine, they have a specific model when they go to do their ranked choice voting, um, where they have jurisdictions that have uh, voting equipment, and there are some that are hand counting as well. Um, the jurisdictions that have just hand counting, they send all their ballots to the state, and the state does the counting for them. They'll run the ballots through the scanner and they can combine those digital results with all of the other, um, the ballot data from all the other jurisdictions within the state that have the scanners already. 
So then the state can combine all of that data and then they can do the tabulation process. Um, so there's kind of already a roadmap for Vermont if that if they end up going forward with ranked choice voting. One of the other things is uh, reporting results. So many of us are always waiting for election night results as soon as the polls close. Um, and election officials will have to consider how they get the results quickly and share unofficial results in a way that's easy for voters to understand as well as candidates. Um, and uh, the image to the right um, is a free resource that's available to jurisdictions. Um, it's called RCViz and it takes the results from the tabulation tools and it makes it into a more user-friendly and easy to understand display. Um, and so this is just a static image, but you can, on the, the website itself, you were able to go through the rounds and there's different kinds of sand key and bar charts and these kinds of things that um, voters can play around with depending on what works best for them. Um, and then the last thing is looking at some of like their audits and recounts. And that's something that election officials will need to work with some of the policymakers to um, make sure that you know all the ranked choice voting rules and the current existing rules work together. Um, so the next we have our mock election results. So um, if you are currently voting or haven't voted yet, make sure you get that in real quick. I'm gonna be pulling up the results as they are coming in. So this will be live. All right, so everybody should be able to see that. So as we can see here, we have about three, let me refresh the page just to make sure we've got everything. All right, we're up to 41 votes. So in this case, we have a clear front runner of former representative Liz Cheney. Looks like she's slowly accumulating more votes uh, and she does end up crossing the threshold of getting a majority in four rounds of counting. Um, and let's see, what does the democratic side look like? Uh, we have a close one, the top two candidates. Yeah, that's definitely real close, only one vote apart. So Elizabeth Warren was able to uh, maintain a narrow lead and then end up crossing threshold in the fourth round. So both of these went to four rounds of counting, which means um, we definitely had some, some close elections here. Um, but it's definitely really interesting, especially I'm sure as some of you were voting and it took you to the results page, maybe the results might've been a little bit different as more votes were coming in. And then I'll just put up the contact page. If you have any questions for us after the uh, presentation and want to follow up with anything, we're always happy to um, answer any questions about ranked choice voting. Um, but otherwise, we'll turn it over to the Q&A section. That was such a great presentation. Thank you so much, Ryan. And um, stick around because I think that some of these questions that are being asked, you might be able to help us answer. Um, I am looking at questions that have been submitted. And um, so uh, we have a question from one of our attendees who says, um, why don't we implement RCV for all elections in Vermont? Um, that's one that that I think I can answer because, um, you know, as you can imagine, uh, ranked choice voting works best in races where you have more than two candidates. Right. If you only have two candidates, you you're going to be more likely to get somebody who uh, who passes the threshold in that first round. Um, another reason why we might not implement RCV for all elections in Vermont is uh, there are a lot of details that we have to work out about how ranked choice voting is going to work in a state that has some communities that have tabulators to count their votes and other communities that are hand count towns. So we're taking a slow and careful approach to how we uh, how we do rank choice voting here in Vermont. And um, I hope that you'll come back and tune in with us next week as we talk about some of those details with a couple of clerks who have familiarity with uh, rank choice voting. Um, there is another great question um, that I want to get to, and uh, and that is, uh, can a town 
uh, adopt ranked choice voting uh, by a charter amendment. And that's a, a question that's particular to Vermont. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, that is in fact how Burlington adopted ranked choice voting for their city council races in uh, 2021 and then um, extended it to all local races as Ryan said. Uh, later on. And so the charter change process is one that starts uh, in your local community. And uh, once your community has voted in favor of a particular charter change, that becomes a bill in the legislature. And if it makes it through the legislative process, then your charter change is adopted and your community could shift. Um, uh, let's get some more questions going too. Um, Let's see. So um, the, we have a, a, a question, Ryan, that maybe you can help answer. Um, it's a, a question about Alaska and about the movement to step back from ranked choice voting. Um, there was a citizen petition and a bill is making its way through the House, but has not yet um, gotten great support in the Alaska Senate. So uh, do you do you have any understanding of what's going on on the ground in Alaska and and what that movement might be about? Is it about ranked choice voting or is it about politics? What what can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's um, sometimes what's happening in Alaska is uh, an example of what happens when uh, the results of an election might not necessarily be what one party wants or uh, and so. Um, gets caught up in that. The method of the election gets caught up in the results. Um, ranked choice voting as a system is nonpartisan. It doesn't care if you're a D or an R, you're a Libertarian or a Green Party or anything in between. Um, you know, and what's going on in Alaska is it seems like, you know, they were unhappy with the results of the 2022 election. Um, and so they blame ranked choice voting for that um, when, uh, you know, there potentially could have been different campaign choices that were made during, during that cycle. Um, and, you know, sometimes that just gets mixed into the system and, and, you know, that's politics as it is. Yes, for sure. And uh, I guess it's fitting that we're talking <laughs> politics when we're talking about elections. Um, here's a great question. What if I don't even want to give the fourth place candidate uh, the ink that it would take to fill in their circle? What if I only want to rank three people out of the possible choices? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when it comes to ranked choice voting, you can rank as many or as few, depending on the number of spaces that you have available to you. So uh, if you only like one person, you can rank only one person. Uh, if you like two people, you can rank two. Um, and if you have, you know, up to 10, like we were saying with Dominion, you can rank up to 10 of them if your heart desires and you have opinions about all 10 of them. Um, so yeah, it's really dependent on, on, you know, who you want to vote for, but there's no requirement that you use all of the spaces. Yep. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, so could there be more than four rounds? Yeah, there could definitely be more than four rounds. Um, if it's a very contentious uh, election and there's a lot of candidates running, you're probably gonna have a lot of splitting votes because um, there's you know, definitely gonna be some overlap between themes of different candidacies. So it could go to additional rounds, but with ranked choice voting, when you do the tabulation, the tabulation itself only takes, you know, a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes, depending on how much data is in there. Um, so that information is all put out at once. It doesn't add any extra delay if there's extra rounds. Excellent. Um, another question is, why do we have to wait until 2028? I want to use ranked choice voting now. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that some states have moved to ranked choice voting quickly. Um, what what have you seen as sort of a, a typical time frame to do a statewide uh, implementation? That's a good question. And a lot of it depends on where the jurisdiction is at and the different um, counties or municipalities, what voting equipment they have, if they have to um, update a lot of the equipment. I would say, and this is a little bit of a ballpark, but an estimate of about two years would probably be good. Um, but a lot of this depends on what is going on within that jurisdiction and how many elections are they doing and those kinds of things. Um, and so I'd probably say about two years, but that can definitely be a little bit quicker if needed because Alaska, they had a special election that quickly moved up their timeline um, and they did a great job with that, even, even with the quicker timeline. 
So there's a couple questions in the Q and A about um, the time delay in getting results. You know, in Vermont, uh, we have a great election night reporting system that the Secretary of State's office uh, gets results up. You know, sometimes as early as 7:30 in the evening for uh, for races that have clear winners. What do you see as the sort of typical delay in the reporting of results in jurisdictions that are using ranked choice voting? That's a really good question. So that was one of the things that came up with both Maine and Alaska, particularly as the, the only statewide uses for um, most of their elections, that um, in Alaska, it took them 15 days and Maine, I believe, was about seven days a week. Um, and that was a, a policy decision that their offices made. Um, so they were waiting to get every single ballot in. Um, in Alaska's case, because it's so geographically large, they're flying them in on uh, planes and and sometimes sled dog, right, um, to get all of the ballots counted in on time. And then they would do the tabulation at the very end. Um, and that was a policy decision that their election administrators made. Um, but there are some jurisdictions, and this is what we recommend as the best practice, of as you get election night results to do the tabulation. Um, so one of those examples we look at is San Francisco. Um, they've been doing RCV for several years, um, and uh, they release unofficial election night results as well as updates periodically as they're counting. Um, I think one of the most recent elections, I'd have to double check, but it was like 15 updates that they did. And so they make it very clear that they're doing, you know, this is when we're doing our next set of counting, and we do the tabulation at the end of that at session. Um, and then they put up on the website unofficial results. This is just this session. Like we're still waiting for, X, you know, X, Y, and Z precincts to come in. Um, but so the delay, it, it kind of just depends on what the election officials are comfortable with. Excellent. Um, one of the questions in here uh, is a great one because it asks very specifically about uh, implementing ranked choice voting in Vermont and uh, the time delay that might be involved in having to transport all the ballots to a central location. Um, as I've conceived of uh, implementing ranked choice voting, I was thinking that it, it probably would be better to do a county level um, ballot collection as opposed to bringing everything all the way to Montpelier. Um, so Tell me what you think about that as a possibility. And then all of you who are interested in this, please come back next week when we talk to some of the clerks who might have ideas about uh, about how that works. But, you know, if if there are five towns out of 30 in a county that are hand count towns, couldn't we just bring all of their ballots to one central location and uh, and do the tabulation there and and bring all the results together after? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have to look into like the nitty gritty of the details, but I think, you know, at, at first uh, glance, I think that sounds like a pretty reasonable solution that uh, working with a partnership of other counties uh, definitely seems to be something that could work. Um, I know in Utah, there are some, if a municipality um, has RCD and the county um, either doesn't have the equipment or isn't as cooperative, they can work with the municipality, can work with another county. Um, to do the tabulation for them. That's something they have as an option in their law. So there's definitely some precedent for kind of that intergovernmental cooperation. Um, it's definitely something that could be explored. Yeah. Um, so one of the questioners says it's uh, it's very confusing to people. Um, the RCV ballot is really four votes if there are four candidates and, and suggesting that perhaps we really need to make it very clear to people, do do jurisdictions who are using ranked choice voting for the first time uh, find that there are a, a greater number of spoiled ballots, for instance, if someone didn't realize that they needed to pick one in the in column one and one in column two and one for column three? Yeah, that's a good question. And getting data on spoiled ballots is actually very hard because there's not a lot of tracking that goes on for some of that sometimes. Um, and so sometimes with legislation, they either require tracking or, or better data collection, but that's something we don't have a lot of data on. Um, but one of the things that can be helped with that is um, providing education to some of the poll workers that are there so that they can um, answer any questions that voters have um, when they're either about to vote or if they have any questions while they're voting. Um, and that can help mitigate some of any of the spoiled old ballots that would happen. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Um, here's another question that may uh, cross over into that sort of political, um, but the questioner is wondering, they've seen some states that are working on legislation to, uh, to actually prohibit RCV from being used anywhere in that state. Um, and the questioner is just wondering why that would be. Do you think that falls back into that political category? Yeah, I think that would definitely be the case of um, politics. And uh, we've seen, you know, national politics bleeding into the local politics. And so that it, that is a factor. Um, there are some states or jurisdictions that are banning RCV, even if the there's no advocates there pushing for it. Um, so some of it's just connected to they're worried it might have an impact on the outcome. And so they're trying to prevent it um, before it comes to their jurisdiction. But um, you know, that just gets into the politics of it, uh, as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, some jurisdictions that are using RCV have adopted it because it was a citizen led initiative. Yeah, definitely. Especially if, you know, um, you know, this can be a challenge for elected officials and that, you know, it's the way they're elected. And so there might be some apprehension of changing how it is they get elected. So, um, there are some jurisdictions where the voters felt passionately enough that um, they wanted to try and get it either on the ballot initiative and, um, and try and get it passed that way. Yeah, it's fascinating because, the, you know, the thing that I like about RCV is it really it really calls on candidates, politicians to uh, to to try to appeal to a broader swath of the electorate. Right. So you might have a majority of people who belong in one party. Um, but that might not be enough to win in a, in a, a majority election. So asking those candidates to really think about what is what about your messaging helps you appeal to people who are uh, of a different party or maybe unaffiliated. Yeah, definitely. And that, you know, one of the benefits of ranked choice voting is that it can uh, reduce some of the mudslinging that goes on in our politics that we're all too familiar with now. Um, because you're trying to reach out to people that, you know, hey, even if I know I'm not your first choice, I hope I can be your second or your third choice, that if it goes to further rounds, that um, you'll still support me, even if I'm not your first choice. Yes, exactly. Um, I'm wondering, um, there's a question here about being a little bit confused about what happens if that if the third or fourth place person is eliminated and their votes are applied to one of the top candidates. Um, because I'm not sure that we saw this. Uh, I think the the mock election results were were rotating through pretty quickly. Um, but I'm wondering if you can call the, those back up again and, and help us see how it is that someone who might have been in second place could actually overtake first place when we eliminate uh, one of the uh, lower down candidates and apply their votes to the remaining candidates. And that might help to uh, to answer this participant's question. Yeah. So um, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So let me restart this one. Um, so in theory, and we have seen, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen that um, a second place candidate or even a third place candidate could overtake and become a winner. Uh, one of these examples is actually the congressional election for Maine in 2018, uh, where the second place candidate went on to win in the next round. Um, and so in this case, it is entirely possible that, um, you know, if Senator Booker had a lot of cross share with Elizabeth Warren um, or Jamie Raskin, um, that it uh you know, or if Vice President Kamala Harris, if she had a lot of support from Jamie Raskin voters that she could, especially with only a one vote split, um, overtake and become the winner um, in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, I think the question might have also been addressing this, but it might not have been. Um, if you rank a candidate and they've been, you know, we get to a fourth round of counting like this is um, and uh, your next ranking is an already eliminated candidate, essentially your ballot will skip them and go to the next candidate after that. So if it's say your third ranking is a candidate that's already been eliminated, um, they're, they're referred to as in, inactive. Um, and so your ballot will skip that ranking and go to the next one, um, then uh, count for that candidate. 
Excellent. All right. So here's a good question. I've heard some people say that uh, RCV violates the one person, one vote rule. Um, can you give us some background on uh, on that and, and why that isn't true? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and we sometimes get that it by you know, during the legislative process. But um, in this case, with right choice voting, every voter still only gets one vote, only one ballot. Um, and it's similar to a runoff election that if your first choice is eliminated, that voter has the option to show up to the runoff election, just like you have the option to uh, vote in the or use the additional rankings um, in the uh, on the ballot. So it's, you know, every voter is treated equally and you only still get that one vote. Um, it's just kind of the same thing as a runoff. It's just happening instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there was a question here that asked how RCV would interact with the electoral college system. And of course, we're contemplating this for our presidential primary. So I, I'm going to throw that softball to you and let you uh, take a crack at it. Yeah. Um, so with ranked choice voting, at the end of the day, especially with um, the primary and the electoral college, it's all about accumulating delegates or electoral college votes. So at the end of the day, it's about winning the state. And so with the primaries, um, you have the single winner and bottoms of RCV. And with the um, presidential general election, you would just use single winner RCV because we're just trying to determine who wins the state. So whoever wins the state gets all the electoral college votes, um, unless that is changed, but that's a bigger issue not besides right choice voting. Right, right. Well, we could we could spend a lot a lot of time talking about national popular vote. I think yes. the key to uh, to understanding the answer to that question, though, is to remember that we're contemplating this for the presidential primary. So we're contemplating this for the way that Vermont would award our delegates that go to the Democratic convention and the Republican convention. And the Electoral College is really a function of that general election. Are there any challenges that arise fairly frequently across jurisdictions that slow the adoption of ranked choice voting? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so our organization, we do uh, what we call an RCV maps assessment. So it's our multi-state assessment um, project. And we look at all 50 states plus DC and we look at their voting equipment and how ready they are essentially to adopt ranked choice voting. Um, and the one of the biggest hurdles we see is voter the equipment because it's just so expensive to replace. Um, and then the other thing is probably planning for voter education and the other kind of like costs related to that. Um, we don't go around saying that ranked choice voting adoption is free. You know, we, that's just not realistic. Um, but there are definitely a lot of resources available to jurisdictions that can make it as easy as possible. Um, and in the cases where you're, if it's a jurisdiction that has that old legacy equipment, it needs to be replaced anyways. It's from the early 2000s, um, most likely, and uh, um, it needs to be replaced whether or not you're adopting ranked choice voting. Um, so if you're adopting ranked choice voting, that's a good impetus to kind of move that process along. Will it require a statewide vote to institute ranked choice voting? And if it passes statewide, how would that affect town or city charters? Um, so the way we are planning to advocate from our office is that the legislature will pass a bill that will institute ranked choice voting for the 2028 presidential primary. So it wouldn't require a popular vote um, across the state. It would simply require a majority of House members and a majority of Senate members um, and the governor to agree. Because <laughs> uh, remember, once a bill passes both chambers in the legislature, it goes to the governor's desk for signature. Um, and so there, there won't need to be a, a statewide popular election or vote on this. Um, and so it, it really shouldn't impact uh, towns and cities that are using ranked choice voting, um, other than perhaps to bring them into the spotlight as models for how you educate voters um, when you're shifting from uh, from the previous method to, to ranked choice voting. And so we certainly will be looking to our friends in Burlington to help us understand. And uh, spoiler alert, the Burlington City Assistant Clerk who is in charge of elections in Burlington will be our panelist next week. Um, and she'll be able to talk a little bit about the work that they have done to help educate voters. Um, 
There's another question in here that if a town charter specifically calls for the use of Australian ballot, um, would there need to be a charter change? Um, Australian ballot simply is uh, is a way of denoting that you are using a paper ballot as opposed to taking your vote from the floor at town meeting. Um, many of our larger communities have shifted away from an in-person town meeting to elect their local officials and have instead moved to an Australian ballot. Um, but I to my knowledge, Australian ballot does not in any way preclude a community from saying that on that ballot, we will be using a ranked choice uh, voting method. And let's see, would ballot data be transmitted differently than how the totals are transmitted now? And are there any additional security concerns? Um, so when when ranked choice voting is used statewide and the tabulators uh, need to send their data to a central place, um, how is that done in Maine or in Alaska? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and I'm actually was currently working on a, a paper related to this project. Um, and so, you know, it can vary. Uh, some jurisdictions require the physical transportation of election data. Um, and some of that comes down to also the decision of when you want to post election night results. Um, so if you're just doing the first round and then you're the first round of um, counting the first choices on election night, and then you're going to wait either a couple of days so you get all the data together um, like Maine does, um, they have the ability to do physical transportation of both the ballots as well as um, like memory, like a flash drive of the data and then connect it to their tabulation software. Um, and there are some jurisdictions that are, are utilizing um, digital transfer of election night results. Um, they're already using that for their plura plurality elections. Um, and so that can be adopted to take ranked choice voting data um, and connect it. And then the one caveat for this is that it's all unofficial election results. For the official results, that tends to be um, days or weeks after the election. Um, and those tend to follow a lot more strict procedures um, for getting the physical data to whatever location that the state decides. Yeah, and I think to to this um, attendee's question about there being any additional security concerns, certainly um, anytime you're transporting ballots, those ballots are the uh, the proof of someone's intention in that election, and so there would need to be a great deal of care given to make sure that those um, ballots are kept secure as they're being transported either to one central location or to a distributed um, uh, ballot counting locations across the state. Um, when I spoke with the main secretary of state, um, she uh, let me in on a, on a little hint that made it easier for her to figure out how to transport ballots. And that is that in Maine, the Department of Motor Vehicles actually falls under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of State's office. So she has uh, licensed law enforcement officers uh, that work for the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, who she can assign to help bring ballots together. And so that will be one of the questions that we have to talk about as we start thinking about transporting ballots is who are going to be the, uh, the, the secure transporters of those ballots. Yes. And, you know, one of the ways that we are able to check to make sure that our election results are accurate in Vermont is that we always have those paper ballots and indeed, it, uh, one month after a general election, we do an audit where we choose uh, a number of towns across the state, some hand count, some uh, tabulator towns, and we actually bring their ballots to one location, check those results against what was reported um, on election night, just to make sure that all of those uh, towns had accurate counts recorded. And we find that in Vermont, the you know the men and women in our uh, in our town clerk's offices, who are your local elections officials, are really very very careful, um, and they go to great lengths to make sure that the results are uh, recorded um, properly in their office and then entered properly into our system. Um, None of our tabulators are connected to the internet in Vermont. They're all their own unit. And the clerk, you know, prints out a, a tabulator tape at the end of the night and, and enters those into our secure system. 
Um, and so, you know, we would certainly want to make sure that as we move to ranked choice voting, that we are using those same um, principles of, uh, you know, isolating those units from the internet, um, not allowing the possibility of, uh, of any widespread hacking um, and making sure that those ballots are transported safely and securely if we're bringing them together for a central count. I think that's just about it for um, for questions that I'm seeing here. Do you have any other uh, sort of uh, frequently asked questions that you think we ought to run through before we sign off for the night? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that if you're trying to learn more about RCV, um, one of the biggest things that I find helpful is looking at videos. Um, just being able to like see some of like either the ballot transferring or different examples of things moving around. Um, we have some RCV 101 videos on our website, but there's also a number of jurisdictions that have also produced their own voter education videos. Um, and so I definitely find those both enjoyable, um, but I'm also a ranked choice voting nerd, um, <laughs> as well as uh, educational for trying to learn about um, how the system works and in other places as well. Yes. Well, thank you so much for pointing out the resources that folks can look into. Um, I, I expect we'll have a lot of conversations about ranked choice voting in the coming months. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that we'll have you back for a future uh, presentation when we, uh, when we do another round of these uh, as we get closer to trying to move a bill through the legislature. So um, Ryan Kirby, thank you so much for being with us tonight and thank you for sharing all of your, uh, all of your great resources and information. Uh, we really appreciate it. Of course, thank you so much for having me. So next week we will be joined by uh, two clerks who run elections in Vermont. Uh, we'll be joined by the Burlington City Assistant Clerk who is in charge of elections in Burlington, who has experience running ranked choice vote elections in Burlington. And we'll also be joined by the Brattleboro Town Clerk, who uh, Brattleboro does not currently have ranked choice voting, but uh, but this clerk has previously lived in Maine where there was ranked choice voting. And so she's familiar with it. Both of these clerks have been um, talking with their fellow clerks from other parts of the state about what uh, a, a statewide ranked choice uh, vote would look like. Uh, and so we will really try to unpack a lot of the challenges um, what are the logistics that we need to figure out? Uh, are there things that we need to change about the way we do elections? Um, and, and what could we reasonably expect for the timeline for reporting results? Because we do know that Vermonters uh, are very used to having their results. Um, I think Vermont's Democratic primary for the presidency this year was was called for Joe Biden at you know 702 by some some of the press uh, who were watching our results. So um, you know we will have to manage expectations, but we also need to be looking to our clerks to say you know what what can we expect? How can we do this? So uh, next week that's May eighth, um, same time, same format. So if you haven't already registered for the May eighth um, webinar, please do. And I want to say again a special thank you to uh, to to the League of Women Voters and um, and our support staff here at the Secretary of State's office for helping to pull this all together. I'm going to throw uh, the microphone back to Sue Racinelli, and uh, she and Betty will send us off for the evening. So thank you so much, Sue. Thank you, Sarah. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's program. We hope you have a better understanding of ranked choice voting. In wrapping up this evening, I would like to thank Ryan Kirby, our speaker, Secretary of State Sarah copeland Hansers, and her staff, Brian Mills, Wesley Dunn, and Rachel Ona, Orca Media, and the League member, Betty Keller. Please register for our webinar next Wednesday on May the 8th, and have a good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>